Welcome to Tech Intersect. I'm your host, Tanya Evans, and my life and work exist at the heart of law, business, and technology. Yeah, I've earned a few fancy titles and degrees over the years, but the bottom line is I'm a writer, speaker, teacher, and lifelong learner. And I'm really excited that you've joined me on this journey. So what is Tech Intersect? Well, it's authentic, empowering conversations with really interesting guests who demystify complex topics to prepare you for the future, because your future is now. And it exists where law, business, and tech intersect. Get ready to listen, learn, and leverage. Let's get started. In this episode of Tech Intersect, I reconnect with Clev Mesador. She is founder and fearless leader of the National Policy Network of Women of Color in Blockchain, policy advisor to the Blockchain Association, and author of her memoir, The Clevolution. Now, in episode 26, we had this authentic and empowering conversation about race, crypto, and financial inclusion. And we also explored the importance of the lessons of freedom from Juneteenth as context for the broader conversation of economic empowerment. This time around, we decided to capture our real-time reflections on the bipartisan compromise to a crypto tax provision in the Senate's $1 trillion infrastructure bill after a vote on Monday, August 9th. So it's one day for this week, but if you're listening to this episode later, this happened on August 9th, 2021. This episode airs August 10th. To get you up to speed, U.S. Senators Cynthia Lummis, which rhymes with hummus, from Wyoming, she's a Republican from Wyoming, and Pat Toomey, a Republican from Pennsylvania, announced the compromise language to include in the bill that involved Democrats and Republicans and even the Treasury Department. And that all happened earlier in the same day, saying that this language would exempt crypto transaction validators from a broadened definition of broker. Now, this discussion of who is considered a broker is really, really important because the way the original language was crafted and included in an 11th hour, somewhat clandestined way, the definition of broker went well beyond those who actually custody funds and facilitate buying and selling and trading. The overly broad language would include folks like software devs or node operators and blockchain protocol validators, folks in the industry who have no control over funds and who don't collect user data and therefore couldn't comply with a treasury reporting requirement if they wanted to. The amendments and compromise language sought to narrow the definition of broker to apply only to those who actually custodied crypto on exchanges for the purpose of buying, selling, and trading. I talk with Cleb about why that's a critical distinction. We also explore the past, present, and future of crypto legislation. So this is a must-listen episode, and you may have to listen more than once. For more information about crypto assets and the future of digital assets more broadly, please sign up for one of my courses or an upcoming free From Cash to Crypto Masterclass. And for a deeper dive, enroll in my upcoming three-day virtual cohort-based coaching course, Decode the Future of Work and Wealth, to explore and demystify the legal implications of crypto and DeFi and digital property like NFTs, metaverses, and more. Details are available at AdvantageEvans.com. So go ahead after this episode, give it a listen, and then head over to AdvantageEvans.com for more information about the masterclasses and the full suite of courses. Okay, now it's time to listen, learn, and leverage. Let's get started. Today, I am really excited to welcome back my dear friend, colleague, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated sister and crypto comrade, Clev Mesador to Tech Intersect. She is the National Policy Network of Women of Color and Blockchain lead, also policy advisor to the Blockchain Association and author of The Clevolution, which she'll tell us more about uh, when we get into the meat of this conversation. Clev is one of my absolute favorite people in the blockchain space, one of the hardest working and definitely one of the best connectors. And I wanted to talk with someone really smart, 
really plugged in to all the goings on in Congress at this very interesting inflection point on the Hill, because we're living in a time where legislative and policy considerations for the infrastructure bill are showing the nation and indeed the world that there is no discussion of innovation in infrastructure without the crypto industry and blockchain technology. It's moved a discussion that we've been having on the margins perhaps over these years to the very forefront of American politics. And today we're going to delve in at a high level, but to really explain to you what is going on, where we've been, where we are, and maybe talk about where we might go, given what happened in the Senate today. So we'll talk about all of that in a moment. But first, Clev, welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. And I'm thrilled to be back again. And I want to commend you for you know this platform and this program is very informative and it serves a great purpose. So I'm thrilled to be here, but I wish it was under better, better circumstances because this yes. show is quick way. <laughs> exactly. We were texting and emailing and watching the live stream and tweeting all day. This is an afternoon I can't get back. But you know what? I'm really proud of the the industry. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But, you know, regardless of whatever, I don't know, I'm going to use the word faction because it's late in the day and I can't think of another one. But sometimes, particularly on Twitter, you can see a lot of beefing from various communities, Maxis here and ETH Rainbows there. But you know what? Regardless of where you were positioned in the collective, you or we were positioned in the crypto industry, we all coalesced for such a time as this. Um, and so I am proud about that. And, and we live to fight another day. So so let's tell everybody what the infrastructure bill, well, everybody probably knows at a larger level the infrastructure bill and what that is, but more specifically how it relates to why we're even talking about crypto and infrastructure in this bill. Yes, yes. So obviously, you know, President Biden is finally moving the infrastructure bill forward, which is a win-win for the nation. And it would have been wonderful to have, you know, blockchain cryptocurrency included in the meats and bones of the bill. But actually, where crypto lies in this bill is in the pay for section. So it was recent, it was essentially like two weeks ago at the 11th hour that the Biden administration and Senator Portman in the Senate, you know, revealed that they were looking to pay for the infrastructure bill by strengthening crypto reporting standards where they felt they could get $28 billion. And as we know, President Biden, you know, committed to saying he's going to pay for the bill. And so the concern was not the crypto community saying we don't want to pay our taxes. We know that crypto is already regulated. We know that we've had to pay our taxes. What this bill did is it extended the definition of broker and it, it took it to individuals. So the, the original provision for the pay for was so broad that you could see that it could in- include miners and validators, whether it be proof of work or proof of stake, you know, the software and hardware developers. And so that that's what the, this fight was about. It was about this expansion of the definition of broker to get to the $28 billion. And also some of it seemed retroactive as well. Mm-hmm. But we have to fast forward, right? Today, as you mentioned, it was the big day. So you're right, the crypto community really, really band together. You know, you, you had people spoke. We made over 40,000 calls to senators. Mm-hmm. Fight for the Future was lagging those calls. You know, the Blockchain Association, Coin Center, and others coalesced groups to sign a letter that was sent to Mitch McConnell and Schumer. And you know, Advantage Evans Academy was one of the co-signers. My organization, National Policy Network of Women of Color, was one of the co-signers. We had over mm-hmm. hundred, over 100 startups, state associations, you know, black chain companies. So we actually mobilized. And, and in some cases, there were people in the, com- community, in the crypto community that were, you could say, silent or did not speak up. But we found out that some of them, they were just operating under in a more quiet way. You know, they were calling right. their senators. They were leveraging relationships. So it was a great fight. And I would say, despite what happened today, that some crazy Senate pr- procedure actually, you know, pushed our compromise amendment to become a casualty of the Senate, 
you know, this is a win for the crypto community. You, you'll you notice that the Biden administration and Senator Porter taught, OK, we can get support for this. Right. The crypto community right. says there's a large market value here. But this went too far. And so we the, the first amendment, we got Senator Wyden, Senator Loomis, you know, Senator Toomey worked together for the first amendment to get rid of the individuals, again, like the miners and the software developers and, mm -hmm. and wallet creators. And then we were getting momentum there. And then, you know, the White House and Treasury band together with Senator Warner and Portman to get another, another amendment that did not fully exclude those individuals, but some. And that's why we felt they were choosing winners and losers, right? In, in right. that in, in that amendment, you know, they they they, they pinned proof of work validators against proof of stake validators. So which brought us to we fought that and we got them to rethink it, go back to the table, debate, debate. So much so that Political and Washington Post gave the crypto community credit for actually stalling mm. the bill because we thought that this decision was so important and the White House and Treasury and the senators were paying attention. But as you know, we, we, we were texting and emailing and watching the floor. <laughs> we did not lose the Senate procedure, some technical piece where in the Senate, because it's a smaller body, any one member can actually object because as people know, last night there was a vote, they were going to move forward, but there's this thing called unanimous consent. And so we mm -hmm. were confident that if it went to unanimous cons consent, we would actually win. And so, and there were some members we thought would object because if any member objected, the, the amendment would not go through. And oddly enough, Senator Shelby from Alabama objected, not because of the crypto amendment or the provision, but because his amendment for a, an additional $50 billion in defense funding fail. So, right. so essentially for him, it was, I'll give you crypto if you give me $50 billion in defense. And obviously that wasn't passable. So now we take the fight to the Senate, right? But, right. but, but at the end of the day, where we are right now is the Senate bill reverts back to that original provision that is broad, that where the definition of broker is far reaching to these individuals who we know are not brokers. They're, they're micro enterprises, they're small business owners in the 21st century innovation economy. Yeah, well, let's pull back and, and talk a little about, bit about that because it comes down to this very, very broad and sweeping definition of broker and what that means. And obviously, any broker in the crypto industry would be regulated in the same way that other brokers are. The wrinkle is how this technology works. And the broad sweeping language was actually capturing, as you said earlier, folks who are working in the space and a decentralized space. Maybe they're building a DAP, they're a coder, they are operating a node, they are facilitating and supporting the infrastructure, but they're not actually custodying the assets which is what, um, where the argument is made from a reporting side of if you are capturing, buying, selling, and trading information that as a matter of know your customer and anti-money laundering provisions, that they would want you to capture that information to increase this, you know, the, the, you know to make the treasury happy, right? This is coming down to taxes, as you yeah. said. <laughs> and what yes. the um, what the choke points are or the friction points where there would be regulation in that space. None of the senators want to get around that part. Right. But what they're trying to avoid is those who not only are not functioning as brokers in the traditional finance or trad fi way that I think many folks are thinking of, but they couldn't even report if they wanted to because they just aren't operating yes. at a level of technology that would even capture that information. So it really becomes, let's, you know, if this passes, okay, it passes in word, but where's the rate, you know, what's how where's can the you enforcement, comply? right? How can you comply? And then therefore, if no one can comply, then how can you enforce? So it becomes ridiculous. And so just like to set the stage there, because I know that there were also two different versions of an amendment. And I'm wondering yes. if you could talk a bit about that. We know that what we ultimately saw today was, let me, and let me see if I get this right. I don't have the notes in front of me. We have Toomey, Warner, <laughs> Lummis, Cinema, and 
Portman. And yes. uh, this was what we saw today. But there were like two tracks that were trying to solve for this. Talk a little, talk us through that. Yes. And and to the point that you made was very important because the the, the expansion of the de- definition to these players who are who don't have customers, who can't right. comply. But but that it even went even further because that's where the conversation about surveillance came to forth, right? Because if you're now asking software validators and I'm sorry, software and hardware developers and validators to comply, you know, then you're telling them they have to start capturing personal information, like people's names, addresses, and other personal personal identification that they're not in a position to even legally ask people. So, right. so the, the the broad stroke of this was not just, you know, you're expanding the, you're treating, you know, a, a minor or a validator the same way you would do, you know, your your Coinbase or your you know, Gemini or Binance US, it was now you're forcing them to actually, you know, surveil on people when they don't even have the infrastructure to do that. And so, yes, right. so, so our first, our first team was, you know, by, sorry, Senator Wyden, Senator Loomis, and mm-hmm. Senator Toomey. And we were happy with that amendment. The, the amendment that they, they proposed actually exempted these, these, you know, small operators because they couldn't comply and the amendment said this right Mm -hmm. and so so we were happy this it was a good compromise i shouldn't say happy because we would have been happy if the biden administration had just stricken the pay for the the crypto out of the pay for section not because we didn't want to you know provide but because the the we needed more debate they need to understand this a bit more so the the widen the, the Wyden compromise was great also because it was bipartisan. Senator Wyden, you know, a, a Democrat came to the table. And then, so when we were seeing some movement, the White House worked with Senator Warner and Senator Portman to provide a counter amendment. So the counter amendment, mm-hmm. that's where you saw, you know, them trying to pick winners and losers. That's where you, you saw, you know, that there was a different, they wanted to differentiate between proof of stake validate, validators versus proof, proof of work. So right. Warner wanted to exclude proof of work, but no protections for, you know, software develop, developers and others. And that was a non-starter for us. So we, we fought against that. And as you know, the, the last night they, they voted to move forward. We still felt a compromise was necessary. And that's why this was the only amendment that was going to the floor today for a unanimous consent, right? Because we right. felt confident that, you know, a compromise amendment, compromise means nobody wins, but at <laughs> least, it, you know, we, we, we got closer to where Senator Wyden wanted to be. And as you mentioned, Senator Loomis, you know, Cinema, Warner, Portman came together you know, Wyden did not, Senator Wyden did not stand in the way, but he felt it didn't go far enough. And he, he did not want to, you know, be a part of this one, but he, he didn't want to stand in the way. And unfortunately, mm. again, you know, we, there were some senators we were, we were concerned that they would stand against this and object, and they didn't. Right. The our surprise was a senator from Alabama <laughs> whose concern is defense funding, nothing to do about crypto. He just wanted to also get unanimous consent for defense funding, and there was not an appetite to do that. You love listening to podcasts, but have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? Maybe you want to build a brand, grow your business, or are looking for an excuse to talk about your favorite hobby. Whatever your reason for making a podcast, Buzzsprout is the place to start. Since 2009, Buzzsprout has helped over 300,000 people launch their own podcasts. Buzzsprout walks you step-by-step through the whole process and will give you powerful tools to start, grow, and monetize your podcast. Ready to get started? Click the link in the show notes to get our free step-by-step guide to starting your podcast today. Yeah, and if it and it was interesting to see Cruz stand up and say he in and any other this was like an alternate universe really today. It was very interesting to see it all play out, but saying that he wouldn't support that modification because he knows that to accept that means that it's complete everything's completely DOA. 
um, yes. and nothing would go forward. And, and any um, potential pushback that we were anticipating on the crypto side, I, actually, everybody sat at bay, but they absolutely, I, I know that Bernie Sanders did stand up and there was some back and forth. In fact, I was trying to keep some notes in real time. And then I said, oh, to hell with this. It's not even happy yes. hour yet. I can't keep up. It's too much. Yes. Um, but it was interesting well, to so, see. So Yes, yeah, Senator mm-hmm. Sanders objected to the defense piece. To the defense piece, right. right. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah because there was, there, 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 it wasn't clear in terms of whether they wanted to go to unanimous mm-hmm. consent with the defense piece. And he objected to that, to that addition. And once it went to, okay, so no defense piece, just the, just the crypto piece, you know, Sanders did not object, but Senator yeah. Shelby said no defense funding, no, no way. We hope you're enjoying this edition of Tech Intersect. Our conversation will continue in a moment, but first, a word on an exciting opportunity. There's a more cost-effective and time-efficient way to reach your leading-edge learning and earning goals, to put you ahead of the stiff competition in this fast-paced, tech-driven economy. You need skills, credentials, and a fast track to a competitive advantage. You need it now more than ever, and I can help. The Advantage Evans method puts you ahead of the curve with condensed comprehensive online courses, curated content to leverage your current skills and expertise, live coaching, networking opportunities, and more. Upcoming courses include From Cash to Crypto to Help You Buy Your First Bitcoin, and there are two ways to get your advantage. Advantage Evans Encore gives you maximum experience for your total competitive advantage and access for one year. It includes a live welcome and modules on terminology, buying and selling, exchanges, mining, earning crypto, trading and investing, and also several of the legal issues you need to know in order to be safe and secure as you enter this space. That includes tax compliance, how to plan for a Bitcoin estate, and securities laws to make sure you avoid any legal unforced errors. Now, Advantage Core gives you the essentials. It's a short course to give you what you want and the support you need to buy your first crypto in as little as three weeks with access to the information and replays for three months. And if you're not quite ready for your Advantage and want a sneak peek to try before you buy, then register for a free masterclass where I share my Crypto 101 success checklist and cover current hot topics in crypto. So there truly is something for everyone, including you, to get in on the fast track and learn and earn in the digital economy. Visit AdvantageEvans.com to get started. That's AdvantageEvans.com. And now, back to the conversation. Yeah, and that's a really dif- uh, disappointing part. You know, I guess that people got a chance to see how the sausage is made because no one out of 100 people had an objection on this day for the change to the language that was offered up by Toomey Warner, Lummis, Cinema, and Portman. But it was the opportunity to get something else up, right? So the unanimous yeah. consent. And by unanimous, it literally needs to be unanimous. You cannot have one objection. And so from the first moment when Senator Shelby stands up and reserves the right to object, asks for the modification to support his amendment. As you said, uh, Senator Sanders also reserved his right to object and was concerned <laughs> with the modification. So we're not, we're no longer talking about the unanimous consent request, but the modification there too. Uh, someone from Delaware was in, Texas came in at some <laughs> point, I feel like Arizona, and then the whole thing went to smithereens. And so I saw that's on Twitter. What, that's why that we Twitter can't get anything done. That's right. That's right. We see now. We see now. In case, in case anybody was wondering, we saw it in real time. And so I guess we talk about what, well, what I wanted to do was just briefly read the statement that came out. You can correct me if I'm wrong, maybe Toomey's office on behalf of the whole thing, just a couple of paragraphs. And then I'll get your reaction to mm-hmm. this. And then we'll talk about where do we go from here? Because uh, you know, as you mentioned earlier, this moves from the Senate. It, it, this went back to the original language. There was no unanimous consent for the modification. Now we go over to the House side. And, and so after I read this, let's talk about what you think might come of this. This brief statement came out today. 
on behalf of the bipartisan amendment. There's broad agreement that digital asset exchanges behaving as brokers should be required to report transactions just like other kinds of brokers already do. There is also concern that tax evasion and non-compliance are becoming significant issues surrounding cryptocurrencies and digital assets. In fact, I think it's probably to the tune of, um, I'm going to get my, you know, the lawyer in me wants to get the facts right. And so <laughs> I'm trying to look and see. I think uh, I'll, I'll mention in my post read what the, the concerns are around tax evasion, to be sure. But you can deal with that and you can also be gentle with innovation and actually support, not thwart it. Back to the language uh, says, some have expressed confusion concerning the underlying text of the infrastructure bill, suggesting it would result in the application of reporting requirements far too broadly and ensnare individuals, developers, and other elements of the ecosystem that cannot comply with a reporting mandate. And this is what you were explaining earlier, Clev. So the final point, We've worked with the Treasury Department, and that was a significant part. Let's come back to that. Mm-hmm. Worked with the Treasury Department to clarify the underlying text and ensure that those who are not acting as brokers will not be subject to the bill's reporting requirements. And while each would have drafted this solution differently, right, because we're reacting rather than being proactive about uh, more thoughtful language, perhaps, my my mm-hmm. interpretation, Uh, The language goes on. We all agree it's important to ensure that these obligations are properly crafted to apply only to entities that are regularly affecting transactions of digital assets in exchange for consideration. To best memorialize this common understanding, we, the uh, aforementioned senators, propose to incorporate this important amendment into the infrastructure bill and urge our colleagues to join us in in enacting this bipartisan clarification. So, Really interesting language there. The thing that I mentioned that sticks out to me, uh, Treasury, you know, they Um, Mm co-signed. And uh, that was an interesting part that suggested this was going to be great, but for what we actually saw, which ended up being a fill in the blank show. Your thoughts? (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes. So, yes, yeah, so so obviously for, you know, this bipartisan group of senators, they wanted to be thoughtful. And you mentioned Senator Cruz earlier. He yes. had proposed an amendment to take out the provision for the crypto tax altogether, but there was no bipartisan member. And we knew that in order for us to move any amendment forward in Congress, in the Senate, we mm. needed we needed a, some Democrats involved. So the mm-hmm. statement you read, you know, included Warner in addition, Cinema in addition to Loomis and Toomey and Portman. Mm-hmm. So, so the conversation was, you know, was bipartisan, which was very important. And then Treasury, right? Why was Treasury involved? Because again, you know, the the reason crypto is in the pay for is because that's how Biden thinks $28 billion can actually come from the crypto community. And also when the when the counter amendment to Wyden's amendment was brought forth by Warner, we know that Yellen was part of the conversation, right? right? So, so for the compromise amendment that went for u- unanimous consent today to move forward, we needed Yell, you know, we knew that Yellen and the White House had to co-sign, which is the reason Treasury was involved. They they were the you know entity for you know representing the White House essentially for lack of a better term in these conversations. So but but you see where this conversation about crypto con- cryptocurrency regulations, certainly you know, crypto reporting when it comes to taxes is messy. But you have right. so many players. And so, you know, and I think, you know, we, we're, go- we're going to speak about where do we go from here. I don't think it's just the fact that now, because the bill now goes back to the house, but I think it's for the crypto community. We definitely, for the lack of a bad term, woke up a, a sleeping giant. I right. think I think the White House and the, Sen- the Senate thought, okay, you know, we'll get some resistance, but please, they did not anticipate, <laughs> you know, over 40,000 calls. And I have to tell you, of all of the things we did, and, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the Black Chain Association, Coin Center, I work closely with them. I'm, I'm a consultant for the Black Chain Association. We work members and staffers and all of that. But the most effective thing was mm. that these, these staffers were, were being plummeted by phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So so that they could not look away from. We had people call and say, so should I write a letter? Nope. Call, call, call. <laughs> and, 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 and the Senate did not expect this many phone calls 
this, this much outreach. So it forced them to think that. And so that's why you had three different types of amendments flow through because they could have said, no, this is moving forward. But we brought them to the table. The crypto community did. So as we look to where this bill goes in the house and then for mm -hmm. reconciliation, we have to think about, you know, we now have told Congress that we are a powerful group. We are an army and we want to be compliant and we want to find smart regulation, but you can't right. do it in a punitive manner. And we're going to be at the table going forward. Absolutely. So well said. And, and, and I am really, really proud of that. So often the narrative is around you know, crypto being on the edges and the fringe. And we know that that cannot be true because look at all the time that even Congress is spending on it and regulators are spending on it and various agencies and obviously every stakeholder in the industry. And we're not a monolith, but we were very clear on this point. And so I, I am proud. Exactly. Of that. And even when you read the statement from the bipartisan group of senators, they are concerned about tax evasion. They are concerned about, you know, people skirting taxes, but they knew there was something wrong with this provision. Right. right. So, so so we don't admit we, we, you know, we don't deny that there are problems. We need to walk through them, but we have to do it in a manner that is that's not going to, you know, <clears throat> smother innovation. That's not going to force innovators to leave the U.S., where we can actually be fair and actually look at how do we create an environment where entrepreneurs can be competitive right here in the U.S. Absolutely. And one of the other things I was really excited about is hearing senators use the language of sandbox, right? The regulatory yes. sandbox. It was definitely uh, coming up early and often. And, and for those who don't know what that means, it's creating a regulatory environment that exempts certain behaviors under certain circumstances in order to support innovation, to give yeah. clarity and certainty for those who want to in, engage in best practices and want to do the right thing. But a lot of this innovation will go offshore if people aren't certain. They want to do the right thing. They need clarity and yes. um, a regulatory sandbox. Both we see those percolating up in the states. There is conversation here in Pennsylvania about engaging in or creating a regulatory sandbox. Certainly, Wyoming and and other mm -hmm. areas uh, working as well. But it's a both and thing that's really going to spur and nurture innovation both as a matter of being a republic at the state level, to be sure, but also at the federal level, it's really important. And so uh, what do you, and, you know, we're talking about where we go from here. Now this jumps over to the House. Do we start from scratch? Where, where do we go from here? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the regulatory sandbox, which is a conversation that the crypto community, Blockchain Association, Coin Center, you know, myself of the National Policy Network of Women of Color and Blockchain, we've had, we've been having these conversations. And quite frankly, there's been resistance from regulators and even, you know, from, from the legislative branch, from Congress. And I do think that this debate, this fight, you know, this show of force by the crypto community change the environment because I do think that you know they now see well you can't we're not just going to let you steam all over us so therefore I, I do think where where Congress goes from here where Washington and regulators go from here is to for the first time seriously think about what does a fe federal regulatory sandbox look like and how can they work with the industry to move there so, and I think you're going to see more of these conversations come up as the House debates. Obviously, you know, the House is 500 plus members versus just 100 in the Senate. But, and I think we have much more, you know, we have a lot more allies in the House. Mm -hmm. But I do think that we do, you know, in the Senate now, members are saying, okay, you know, the, this is not just, you know, an industry of, you know, folks with money, you know, they heard from, entrepreneurs, they heard from right. startups, they heard from innovators of color who are in this space. And and let's be honest, you know, brokers like, you know, your large exchanges, they, they, they've had to comply with AML, right? right? We're not saying that they shouldn't, you know, that they, they shouldn't, that they shouldn't have re recording, recording requirements that make sense. But when you go after, you know, the, the software 
developers, the hardware, you know, the developers, the, the validators, that's when you're actually going into, you know, innovators of color, you know, right. the LGBTQ communities, as micro, micro operators who are really leveraging this, this space to start businesses, to start projects. And so now you, in, in the, the federal government is going after us. And I say us because I see myself as a small operator in this space. Right. And I think that was an unintended consequence that they didn't, they didn't realize that this is stifling small businesses because in the innovation economy, independent contractors, micro enterprises are the small businesses that are driving, creating one, two, three, four jobs and fueling innovation. Absolutely. And we see that small business is the the engine that has always driven economies, certainly in the United States and also abroad. And when we think about the future of work, we think about the future of wealth and what that looks like in a Web 3.0 world, right? And you and I are always talking about what it means to participate meaningfully and being included is not just on the investment side, although that's the sexy place where people think, oh, people just have money to burn and they're just throwing it and not paying taxes. No, people are working hard every day to create opportunities for themselves in ways where black and brown communities, LGBTQ community, women, women of color were left behind in that web 2.0 world when we think of the Silicon Valley, right? So I know Mm -hmm. that you are so focused on making sure that that doesn't happen again. So if you had to make the case for now on the house side for representatives to listen and take notice of why this is important for as a matter of uh, economic empowerment, generational wealth, what would you say to them? I would tell them that, you know, that they, I'm not sure what they hear when they hear, you know, the words miners and stakers and validators and node operators. They probably have, you know, some image of, you know, some privileged mm-hmm. kid with a laptop in their parents' basement. But I think we have to start showing them that, you know, we're talking about Tavonia Evans, the, you know, who, who created Guapcoin, right? We're talking yes. about... Hill Harper and Naraj, you know, his partner who created the Black Wall Street app, we're the ones who will be Im- impacted in such a way. And I think when we go to the house, we need to make that clear. We need to make make it clear that, you know, cri- cri- crypto being decentralized diminishes the barriers of entry. And when we look at gener- generational wealth building, that is where, you know, innovators of color are building and creating at the micro level. And, you know, they need to see who is being impacted. And I think, a- again, another reason why regulatory sandbacks make sense, because then we can actually create a level playing field, create rules of the road. Because right now we tend to talk about the crypto community and crypto policy, but let's be honest, right? What, what, what's good for brokers is not good for the micro enterprises, right? right? So we can't just have this one view of, oh, we're just going to do sweeping you know, policy or you know, look at regu- regulation the same way. So, I, so I, I'm hoping that in the House, we'll get an opportunity for more you know, Black, Latinx, LGBTQ, you know, Asian Pacific American innovators to start having conversations with, with Congress. My goal, you were just you know, in Washington briefing staffers, and my goal yeah. is you know, over the next few weeks and months to do more of that. If you're an engineer or a scientist, you love Formula One, you love cycling, you love learning about how new technologies are changing the world around us, then I thought you may want to listen in to my new podcast, the Neil Ashton Podcast. We talk to leading engineers and scientists from around the world, hear about their life stories, hear about new technologies, and hopefully educate you and give you a better sense of how key things like machine learning, artificial intelligence, supercomputing are changing the world around us. If that sounds like it's something you might like, you should come and have a listen. Yeah, I think that the early and often conversations, and I think the impetus for that, when doors and minds hopefully have opened from what happened today and over these these last couple of weeks and moving forward, you know, you always have a partner in power with me. You call, you text, you email, I answer. And so let's continue to to make moves and to grow in the space and to, yes. you know, rising tide lift all, lifts all boats and education is key. And that makes me think before I let you go back to the moving and the shaking that you're a warrior by day, but you're also an author. 
to extending this idea of <laughs> entrepreneurship. And you didn't just happen upon this space a couple of weeks ago or a couple of years ago. You've been working very hard at what you've been doing for a long time. Share a bit about your background and certainly your memoir, Clevolution, which I adore. <laughs> Well, public policy is in my blood. As many people know, I was an Obama presidential appointee at, at the Economic Development Administration. So job creation is part of how I look at public policy. But I also worked in Congress for two members. And I've worked in Washington politics, working on national campaigns. So politics is certainly in my blood. And interestingly, mm -hmm. I first heard about Bitcoin in 2013 when I was a presidential appointee in the Obama administration. I, I didn't get really involved until 2015, 2016, because that's when the conversation opened up to you know, the, the possibilities for the technology, like identity ma management and you know, intellectual property rights. But the, the book, The Clevolution, My Quest for Justice in Politics and Crypto, is because I do see myself as a you know, social justice warrior. And certainly I saw, that's why I was in politics. That's why I sought to, to change things. And even when I became dis disillusioned and left Washington, I found myself in crypto, a place mm -hmm. where we were having this conversation about an economic revolution. So... It has been wonderful for me to marry the two. And certainly the book is really about that, about that journey and the synergies. But also, you know, the work that I do now is that alignment. You know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate to be one of the, you know, few, you know, women of color who, or women period, who, you know, came into this space early on and has such a deep, you know, deep roots in Washington. And I can bring that to the table, but also, you know, I, I took my time to really learn and understand this space and be able to add value. So in my way of seeing myself as an advocate, you know, mm -hmm. as, you know, somebody who's fighting for social justice, that's why I created the National Policy Network of Women of Color and Blockchain. It's really about, you know, making sure that women of color are not, you know, the, the invisible in this space, right? They're not the hidden figures. And so much of the work I do is trying to bring women of color to Washington so members can see that it's not just wealthy white males, right? right. And, and, and as they're looking to hold people accountable, protect consumers, they have to see that we're the consumers, but we're also the, the micro enterprises. And so that, that, that has to shift in terms of their consideration. So it's been great in terms of being, you know, being able to you know, see the book grow and see how people respond to it but also continue to you know, be in this space and, and, and move forward in a very revolutionary manner to try to impact change. Well, that's um, beautiful. You are certainly doing that and more. And, you know, as you were talking, it made me think of the first time you were on Tech Intersect. It was back in episode 26. We had this wonderful and empowering conversation about race and crypto and financial inclusion and explored the importance of education in Black yes. and Brown communities and dramatically reducing barriers to entry and participation. And so we come, not full circle, but we, we springboard ahead <laughs> to this time where if we don't get this legislation right, everything yes. that we have been building for and planning for and educating around will not come to pass. So it's really important that we get this right. I'm so honored to still be connected with you and building with you and to seeing the work, great Likewise. work that you're doing. And um, we're going to we're going to get we're going to keep moving and shaking. We're going to do it. Can't stop. Won't stop. <laughs> yes. And and thank you for the work that you're doing. You know, you're a trailblazer and you create such opportunity for people to have a voice. And even the work that you're doing with, you know, with, with the academy, because mm -hmm. most people don't realize this piece about, you know, crypto financial literacy is important if we're ever going to make it to mainstream adoption. So, you know, keep doing the great work that you're leading. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to have you come and speak to my students, too. I have all of these witnesses listening to us right now. So I need, <laughs> I need your voice. So I'll be following up. Uh, but thank you very much for the kind words. Tell people how they can connect with you, learn more about you and your work and upcoming events. Yeah, so Twitter is great, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, I'm very active on crypto Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and my handle there is at CMESI, at C-M-E-S-I. I'm also on Instagram at cmesador. And, you know, my website, I do have, you know, clevmesador.com. But for the work on women of color, you can go to WOC, 
blockchain policy that come you can you can find the, some of that work there as well but definitely on social media you know is a great first point of engagement because i because you know the crypto community is there is very active and we have a very 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 vibrant you know black and black black and latinx community within that crypto space as well absolutely i will drop all of those links in the show notes and then i'll see you in the twitterverse <laughs> yes, yes. And I'll definitely be, be back in touch because I will actually be doing some sessions on Capitol Hill because, we, peop, you know, innovators of color and crypto don't realize if we don't have the conversations about financial mm -hmm. literacy, if we don't have the conversation about micro enterprises, who will? Because the large, you know, your large, you know, Gemini's and Coinbase's have to fight for the issues that affect them as large, you know, operators. So it's up to the you know, the, the, the micro enterprises to really speak to the issues that impact our communities and really make sure that they're being heard and that they're breaking through. Absolutely. If we don't do it, it won't get done. So let's get to work. Let's get to yes. work to get to the future of work and the future of wealth. Clev Mesador, thank you, my dear. I appreciate you and let the work continue. Yes. In case you had any doubt, crypto is here to stay. It's no longer a fringe topic discussed and held only by a select few. By its very nature, crypto is for everyone, for you, for me, for the collective we. And it's very, very different from the hyper-competitive models of value and wealth we've become all too familiar with. Legislators and regulators and big business they're all in, or at least interested in engaging in the discussion to figure it all out. And you should be too. So take time to learn all you can about crypto assets and their potential and their pitfalls. Steer clear of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And also stay away from FOMO, fear of missing out. Get curious, get informed, get empowered, and then get started. The future is now, so let's go and let's grow. Now, before we sign off, please take a moment to like, comment, and share this episode and this podcast with your networks. Follow me on social media and let me know what topics you'd like to hear more of and who you want to hear from. All right, that's all for this episode. Until next time, continue to shine. Stay in touch with host Tanya Evans via your favorite social media on Twitter at at Tech Intersect and on Instagram via the handle Tech Intersect. This podcast has been produced by Stephanie Renee for Soul Sanctuary Incorporated.